Before we can really delve into the earliest content for the AP World History Modern course, it's important to have some foundational knowledge of the historical events, developments, and processes that led to what human civilization looked like in 1200 CE. So the purpose of this mini lesson is to provide that brief overview before we delve a little more deeply into a few of these developments. Let's start with a look at how historians organize the immense scale of human history. For the earliest human history, what we call prehistory, this is the history for which we have no written records, but ample artifacts discovered through archeology, span historians use geologic and anthropologic timeframes to establish chronology. So first, what is chronology? Well, chronology is the science of arranging events in the order of their occurrence, basically figuring out what came first, second, third, etc. And once humans developed a way to mark the passage of time, they also began to develop calendars. Today, we track chronology through a solar calendar, 365 days a year. When we look at human prehistory, historians start with the Paleolithic, as this is the first era during which recognizable human ancestors, that is, species from our genus Homo, lived. This era is marked by humans' use of basic stone tools, the era is believed to begin around 2.8 million years ago and to have ended somewhere around 10,000 years ago. Now the Neolithic, or New Stone Age, is the era in which humans, who had by this time developed an impressive array of stone tools, began to domesticate plants and animals. It's also when they begin working with metals. Thus, the Neolithic ends when most human societies around the world began depending on metal as opposed to stone tools. Now, the end of the Neolithic also tends to correspond with the beginning of written languages, or the beginning of history. In our modern world, historians use a chronology based on an earlier European and explicitly Christian designation. In the 6th century, Christian Europeans began marking the time after the birth of Jesus of Nazareth by the abbreviation AD, meaning Anno Domini, or in the year of our Lord. In the 8th century, an English monk began using BC, meaning before Christ, to mark all the years of human history prior to Jesus' birth. Fun fact, Europeans had not yet been exposed to the concept of the zero when the AD-BC system came into use. Thus, there is no year zero in this chronology. The concept of the zero was developed around the 7th century, both in India and in the Americas, almost simultaneously. Europeans wouldn't begin to adopt the concept of the zero until the 11th century. In the 19th century, scientists and historians advocated the adoption of new calendar designations, BCE meaning before the common era and CE meaning the common era. While these new designations followed the chronology established by Christian Europe, they also recognized and respected the fact that many non-Christians used the chronology as well and it was a much better idea to designate all of this time frame after the birth of Jesus of Nazareth as a common era, in that we were using a common calendar. So now with that explained, we can focus on humans. Well, all early human species and subspecies were nomadic, probably traveling between two or three different seasonal locations over the course of a year. These groups were hunter-gatherers, and most archaeological evidence indicates that these two primary jobs were most often divided by sex and gender. For prehistoric people, historians tend to think of sex and gender as the same thing for generalization purposes. Now, despite that division of labor, these nomadic groups were largely egalitarian, meaning that all adult members of the group were essentially of equal status. In multiple places sometime around 8000 BCE, Archaeological remains indicate that some hunter-gatherer groups began practicing agriculture and domesticating various livestock animals, such as cows and pigs. Historians refer to this enormous shift in human society as the Neolithic or Agricultural Revolution. The shift to agriculture required these former nomads to stay in one place so they could tend to their crops. For this reason, some human groups became sedentary. They lived in one place year-round. They began to build semi-permanent and permanent buildings, sometimes out of stone, 
and as their group population increased, so too did the size of their settlements. By the time we get to about 5000 BCE, there were multiple cities established all around the world. The transition to agriculture also allowed for greater division of labor. Well, because a relatively few people could care for and harvest enough food for the many, other people could now focus on developing their talents and skills full time. They could specialize. Before too long, these cities boasted weavers, bakers, scribes, merchants. In many ways, these cities would probably have seemed quite similar to our own today. Once humans settled more permanently into one place and the division of labor was normalized, social hierarchies began to emerge. A social hierarchy is when a person's place in society is based on any variety of indicators, such as sex or occupation or wealth. And one of the earliest social hierarchies that emerged was of patriarchy, one which made males of higher status than females. Almost all ancient human societies adhered to patriarchy, which meant that males had more, often much more, political, social, and economic power than women did. These social hierarchies that developed in early cities are what we today refer to as social classes. At the top of the social pyramid were the rulers, followed by other wealthy people often referred to as the nobility or aristocracy. Below them were the workers and artisans, free skilled laborers. Eventually, even this early in human history, you had a class of people who were forced or coerced laborers. They were slaves. Unlike the slave institution of the 16th through 19th centuries, much more on that later in the year, forced laborers during this era were usually prisoners of war or debtors who were slaves for a limited amount of time until they paid off their ransom or debt. As members of the lowest class in society, slaves were often treated poorly. They often had few legal protections and, while enslaved, they were absolutely considered the property of another human being. That said, it was possible to gain freedom by purchasing it. Of course, in an era before coins or paper money, debts, economic exchanges of any kind, were conducted via a barter system. Two people who wanted to exchange goods would have to agree on precisely what the worth of each item was. A prisoner of war who wanted to pay off his or her ransom might have to pay it off in livestock or agricultural products or luxury goods, or with their labor via enslavement. Oh, even after coined money was developed, that money was so rare that most people continued to use a barter system for millennia. As cities grew in size, they often annexed the territory around them as well. Historians call this system a city-state. The territory might include smaller settlements, and these settlements were often in charge of the agricultural work while city dwellers continued with their job specialization. As you can see in the image, these city-states often had walls built around the city proper and then would take care of the territories outside as needed. As these city-states grew more complex, centralized government structures developed as well. Monarchy is one of the oldest forms of government. This is a type of government where one person, as a monarch, a king or queen, is the government. The power in monarchies is often inherited, and especially in the ancient world, monarchs claimed that they ruled because of divine right, because the gods wanted them to rule. Gilgamesh, shown here at left, is an example of an ancient Mesopotamian monarch. In ancient China, this divine right was such an important concept that it had a special name, the Mandate of Heaven. Some societies held their monarchs in such high regard that they were believed to be gods or semi-gods or for sure the most important religious authority there was. This type of government where the ruler is both a religious and political leader, is called a theocracy. Ancient Egypt's monarchs, the pharaohs, were theocrats. They were Egypt's political leaders, and they also served as the highest ranked priests in the entire empire. Over time, some city-states grew so large that they challenged and conquered other city-states, thus establishing empires, 
large territories in which a single monarch known as an emperor rules over multiple groups of other people. The difference between a monarch's territory, often referred to as a kingdom, and an empire isn't just about how large the territory is, but rather how homogenous it is. A monarch tends to rule over his or her own people. It's a homogenous society. While an emperor does that and rules over other peoples as well, it's a heterogeneous society. On the map on screen, you can see some of the earliest empires in human history. In the Mediterranean basin, the people of Greece developed multiple city-states which were ruled by different government structures. Some, like Sparta, were monarchies. Others, like Thebes, were oligarchies, a form of government where political power rests with a few, often the very wealthy. And yet others developed democracy, a form of government where political power rests with the citizens and decisions were made based on the majority preference. Ancient Athens was a democracy, but despite its relatively large population, power rested only with free male landowners, who were the only people eligible to become Athenian citizens. As you can see, no sooner did people begin to practice agriculture and settle down in permanent settlements than they began to complicate the whole process of living. But then, the Neolithic Revolution also ushered in an unprecedented era of innovation domestication of plants and animals and its required irrigation, metalworking, job specialization. In fact, without the Neolithic Revolution, our lives probably wouldn't look very much like they do today. 